It's fine. It's fine. It's fine if you interrupt. I'm just doing this like a regular class. Okay. So I'm just gonna walk in. No problem. No problem. Thank you. 
Testing, testing, can people hear me? If you can hear me, say, uh, I'll address the mini quiz in a second. 
Can people hear me though? Great. I wonder how much of a lag there is between me talking and you typing. So excuse me if I don't. Uh... <clears throat> One second. It's kind of visible. Okay, uh, I might as well start. Hi everyone, welcome. I, uh, this is fun, I get my own show now. So um, yeah, let's first take some time to talk about how things are going with the weekend before I start talking about material. Uh, so I hear, um, I hear some concerns on the mini quiz. Well, first, let me back up. I hear some concerns with, with Proctorio, uh, this thing where you're supposed to scan your surroundings, uh, <laughs> or you scan your surroundings and stuff, uh, all, the other, all the other instructors here, but um, we're doing the best we can. So if you are having trouble with Proctorio, please email me as soon as you can, um, and I will figure something out for you to take the mini quizzes and everything else. But... Uh, if you can use Proctorio, that is the most straightforward thing at the moment. Um, but once again, if it's not working out for you for whatever reason, just email me individually and I will I will make accommodations. I'll figure something out. Uh, I want to test out how long this lag is. So I'm going to ask the question. It is 9.51, probably... 952 right now. Uh, how are you? Go ahead and type it in the chat. How are you? I need I need a DJ or something. All right, like a 10 second. Oh, I'm tired. Okay. <laughs> Sleepy. I gave you extra time. It's like 950 now. I'm sorry, Juan. Rona. <laughs> oh, it's so stupid. Okay. So, yeah, there's like a 10, 15 second lag. Uh, just, we'll have to deal with that. I've got my computer set up right here. I've got something on the, on the board, on the projector here, and I'll write up on, on this thing here. So I'll just pan left and right as best I can. I know, I, I, I avoid going to Costco. I actually call them and check to see if they had toilet paper and they don't. This is the worst time to, I'm actually like legit down my last two rolls. I'm not trying to hoard it and now it's all gone. So <laughs> I guess I'm going to the bathroom here. Let me toilet paper here. Uh, we are going over chapter 14 today. If you look at our board here, chapter 14, nervous tissue. Uh, <clears throat> in lab, we'll be doing activity seven, and I'll explain what our modified lab checks will be. We obviously can't come in and take a look at histology, so we're going to do something else. <laughs> tortillas? Don't waste good tortillas. And um, I'll consider toilet paper for extra credit, but I can't, you need to guarantee me that like you irradiated the the toilet paper rolls before you gave them to me or something. <clears throat> okay. So first thing, 
Quattorio, if there's any uh, if there's any uh, issues with that, please notify me as soon as you can, and I will figure something out for you to do. Yes, there is a mini quiz that was available 20 minutes ago at the normal time at 9.35. Um, and it, yes, you only have five minutes. Does five minutes not seem enough? I feel like that's one minute per question. There are five questions. For those of you that did do it, let me know what you thought about um, what you thought about uh, the mini quiz. I'm going to wait for you to type that. I'm going to check something about how much more time. How much? I mean, this like ten. Pictures are blurry. Hmm. Oh, I see. So there's added time because you have to go through that whole mess of scanning and stuff. Okay. I will, uh, if you are, if it's asking for an access code, that means there's an issue. Make sure you're using Chrome. Um, and then maybe restart the browser, but you should be doing it through Chrome, not through Safari, not through Firefox. Those are those are the things that you should let me know if uh, if you have issues. Can we redo it? Maybe I, I need to <laughs> I need to figure things out. Um, and I'll see if I can eliminate that scan, Katrina. Let me. Okay, so I got your feedback for the mini quiz. I will I will probably not count it if, it, if the grades for it aren't great. Let me just check something for the lab checks. You all should have a way to turn it in. A bunch of you have already submitted it online. So some of you who are asking how to turn in lab check seven, you can scan or take pictures of your your written packet, scan and take pictures, scan or take pictures of it, and then upload it to Canvas. When you go to Canvas, When you go to Canvas, uh, you go to Assignments and then click on Lab Check 7. Here's Check 7. For you, there will be a, an icon here at the top right that says Submit Assignment. And, and then you can submit your assignment. Some of you have already, been done, have already done that. Take a picture, send it through email, just, just get it to me somehow. Um, yeah, I'll about the scanning of the room thing. I'll I'll address that for the next for the next assessments. This is a fun trial and error phase. But yeah, so to upload your assignments for whether it's Lab Tech Seven or any other assignment that we'll be doing, you go to assignments, you go to assignments, and then click on the specific assignment, and there will be a button there for you to upload the assignment. Failing that, you can always email me. Always email me your assignments. Uh, Times lab check due. I mean, technically it's due for Monday, Wednesday. It's due at eleven. It's due at eleven for Monday, Wednesday, and it's due eight a.m. tomorrow for Tuesday, Thursday. Uh, okay. Let's see. Maria, please email me. I'll get back to you about what the problem is with the access code. Um, yeah, I'll get rid. I'll figure out the scanning thing and add more time for the mini quiz. Um, Tuesday, Tuesday, Thursday, students still submit Tuesday, Thursday. Uh, I'll address how we're doing lab checks, Jessica. I'll address how we do lab checks uh, in lab. <laughs> so around 11 o'clock, I'll start talking about that. 
but it will be modified. It will have to be submitted online. Um, yeah. Any, any last things regarding online assessments? Can there be a grace period for this lab check? Like this current one, the one that you finished last week? <laughs> Wouldn't let you take the test. Again, if you, if you couldn't take the test or, or whatever, if there's if any issues, email me so I can address you individually. I don't want to get lost in this chat. Okay, so last time, any general questions about, I, I will address the mini quizzes, lab checks you turn in online. Um, these recordings are recorded, so you can get back to them later. And I'll address lab stuff in lab on how, what we're gonna do with those different parts. Is there a way to print out the slides? Yeah, you can download the PDF or PowerPoint and print them. Lab activities, I'll get to lab activities later. You're welcome, Tamana. <laughs> All right, I think we're ready to start. Will I do the same type of format for the mini quiz as practicals and quizzes? Uh, by format, do you mean like the online quiz thing? If that's what you mean, Corey, then yes. So I'm gonna try to figure out how to streamline it, make sure you have enough time to actually do it. Um, yeah, yes, it's gonna be like that. There's gonna be, for the practical, there will be pictures with arrows pointing to it, just like the mini quiz. So yeah, just like that. Any other things I can say to help calm your fears <laughs> for this new territory that we're in? The practical will be most, just like last time, it'll be mostly multiple choice with an activity, which is actually also multiple choice, but with a lot of choices, like not just four choices, it's gonna be like 20 choices. Um, so yeah, it, it will be like a virtual version of the practical, multiple choice. Any other things? A practice version? <laughs> That's what the, I guess the mini quizzes are like, so try to try out the mini quizzes. Once again, if you couldn't, if you couldn't do the mini quiz yourself or like the, the Proctorio didn't work for you, email me and I will address it. Test review. Um, Test review, I mean, we have this YouTube channel here and I've explained all the other things. Uh, like I've, I, I have those videos of me pointing stuff out. So that's review. You have the study guides that you can answer questions and you can uh, email me your answers. So that's what you can do for a test review. These videos are saved, so you can view them later. Oh, after the test, I see, I see. Uh, yeah, I don't know, <laughs> to be honest, I don't know. I think it shows you the answers, so hopefully you can review it in that way, and then if you still have questions, like if you're unsure about a certain answer, then you can ask me. So we'll jump that obstacle when we get there but I think you can review it yourself online and then if you, you're unsure of something, I can go over it. Or maybe I can just do a live stream like this. We, we can do that too. Is there a way we can do open lab? Uh, well, this Friday, well, I don't even know anymore. I'm supposed to travel out of town this Friday and who knows if that's gonna be possible anymore. Uh, uh, at the very least, I have those videos of me pointing stuff out. So that's in a way kind of like Open Lab. Okay. 
I'm going to start now. I'm going to pause here and there because because I know that there's this lag. I'm going to pause here and there to take a look at what questions you have. So um, I'm just going to write a note to myself that I'm starting lecture. It's approximately 10.03. All right. <clears throat> Exciting times. Here we go. I'll see that maybe. Great. Okay. <laughs> All right. Here we go. We are going over the nervous system. There's a lot of chapters here that are included within the nervous system. The nervous system is a very big and cool system. Uh, specifically, we're starting with neural tissue. We talked about, like, when we talk about muscles, we first talk about muscle tissue, and then we talk about nervous tissue, or and then the whole muscles. Here we're going to talk about nervous tissue, and then we'll talk about things like the brain and spinal cord and, and nerves. Uh, oops. So yeah, we'll be looking at um, the different divisions of the nervous system. We'll be looking at what makes up nervous system. It's not just neurons. There's also this thing called glial cells. Um, these cells called glial cells that make up most of the, of the nervous system. And we'll talk about what the difference is between those two. We'll talk about uh, how neurons function, how they're structured, how that relates to their function, and relating that to a reflex pathway. I know you've all heard of the term reflex. It's related to the nervous system. Uh, so yeah, what is a reflex? A reflex is where... Um, is where you can sense something and then you can do something as a result of sensing that thing. Uh, so a simple reflex that you all might know is this knee-jerk reflex. You get tapped on your patellar ligament, not your patellar tendon, and it makes you kick your leg out, which means you've activated a muscle. So we've gone from sensing muscle stretch to activating a muscle. That is your patellar reflex, your knee jerk pathway. And so how does a pathway like this work? It works because of the nervous system. The nervous system is great for sensing things, for processing that information, and then for doing something with that information. Quick check, can everyone hear me okay? Can everyone see this okay? I'm gonna wait 10 seconds for this lab. A little blurry. Uh, okay. Great. So, look, I'm too far. So the nervous system is one of two control systems. When I say control system, I mean it's a system in our body that makes other systems in our body do things. So you might think that muscles are, are a control system because muscles control your body. It's more accurate that you, your muscles move, move your body. What controls your muscles? The nervous system does. Um, what controls your reproductive system? Your nervous system and also the endocrine system. So our two control systems in our body are the nervous system and endocrine system. Um, the endocrine system, the way that it controls things, it's through, through hormones, and that takes a relatively long time, like minutes. Minutes is long. Nervous system is really, really quick, short-term responses, takes milliseconds. So like to move my finger, just takes milliseconds of a second. The way we can divide up the nervous system, the major divisions, are the central nervous system and peripheral nervous system. When we say central nervous system, CNS, we're talking about the brain, 
And we're talking about the spinal cord. So yeah, you all know where the brain is, of course. The brain is protected by our cranial cavity. Spinal cord protected by the vertebral foramen of the vertebrae. Um, this is your central nervous system. It's the central, not just because it's literally the center. Um, it's, uh, it's also what we'll call an integrating center. And thank you for those of you responding and helping others in the chat. Peripheral nervous system is anything extending off of the brain or spinal cord. So we've got all these nerves extending out. Anything that's a nerve, that's peripheral. Anything extending off of the brain or spinal cord, that's peripheral nervous system. So we've got the central nervous system for integrating stuff. We've got the peripheral nervous system for sensing and, con and controlling stuff. So here's our nice, big, complex diagram of all the nervous system. We've got the brain here, this is central. We've got stuff on the input side, and we've got stuff on the output side. In a reflex, like that knee-jerk reflex, you need to feel the tap, you need to process that tap, and then you need to do something about that tap. So we've got input, integration, and output. When we say input, this is part of the peripheral nervous system because it's outside of the brain and spinal cord. When we say output, that's also peripheral nervous system because it's outside of the brain and spinal cord. <clears throat> so input means you get some kind of stimulus, some kind of signal. Uh, it could be light, like for me to see something that's light. It could be touch. It could be pain. And there, there are tons of different stimuli. There's more than just five senses. There's a lot of different things that we can detect. We have sensory receptors. You've all learned of some sensory receptors like Merkel cells, uh, Meister's corpuscles, Pacinian corpuscles, hair plexus, muscle spindles. We've gone over all of those. Those are either themselves sensory neurons or they communicate with sensory neurons. And that sends a signal to the brain and then the brain or, or brain or spinal cord, and then that decides to do something and we send stuff out. So let's go closer to each specific part here. Breaking it down, looking just at the afferent division. The term afferent with an A, afferent with an A, that's your sensory pathway. Afferent with an A, that's a sensory pathway. So if you have Oh God, I got to see where I'm going. If you have, uh, let's say here's your Meister's corpuscle, and then here's the rest of the neuron extending to somewhere else. Here's an axon terminal. This pathway, that's an afferent pathway. It's going, it's approaching the central nervous system. Afferent pathways approach. Afferent pathways approach the central nervous system. Did I freeze? Hold that. Okay. Afferent pathways, they send a signal towards the central nervous system. So on our diagram here, we're sending a signal towards the brain or spinal cord. There's a lot of different types of ways, types of receptors. In order to get the signal in the first place, you need special receptor. Three basic kinds. You can have special sensory receptors. And when we say special, these are your traditional senses like vision, taste, hearing, smell, um, and balance. Basically everything except touch. Touch is a different one. We'll get to that in a second. Those are your special senses. We call them special because they require special receptors. Like for vision, you need special photoreceptors in your eye. For taste, you need special taste buds, taste cells. We'll get to all that later on. But you can have a special sense, 
you can have a visceral sense. We've, we've used this term before, visceral. All visceral means is something inside of yourself. So if we have receptors to detect, say, the stretch of your stomach, if we have receptors to detect how hard your heart is beating, um, if our bladder is full, that would be a visceral sense. And then we have somatic senses. A somatic sense, that is touch or temperature or pain um, or pressure. That's what somatic sensation is. Um, even, even how stretched out your muscles are, like those muscle spindles that we talked about, um, how stretched out your tendons are so you don't damage uh, your tendons. So like your, your patellar reflex, your knee jerk reflex, that's a uh, somatosensory reflex. So to recap, on the sensory end, the afferent division, that means we detect something with a sensory receptor, we pass it along sensory neurons, and that's called an afferent pathway with an A, and we send that information to the central nervous system. Afferent. Questions on afferent sensory pathways? Cool. Cool. All right. Talking about the brain and spinal cord, um, that's the central nervous system. The brain and spinal cord, we're putting them together in one category. They're important for integrating information. When I say integrate, what I mean is we need some, we need some way to decide what to do with that information. Um, a simple example that I can give you is uh, What's an example? Oh, okay, like, like a thermostat. The way your, the, the heater in your house works is that there's a thermometer, that's a receptor, it's detecting temperature. There is uh, some kind of computer, and then the output would be turning the heater on or off. So once again, sensing temperature, deciding whether to turn the heater on or off, and then actually turning the heater on or off. The decision, the computer, that's deciding is the temperature too, too low? If it's too low, I'll turn it, I'll turn it on. Excuse me, I'll turn the um, heater on. If it's within a normal range of temperature that we want, then we don't turn it on. Something is making that decision. The brain and spinal cord make decisions for your body. I know we think of the spinal cord as, we think of the brain as the main decision center, but the spinal cord is a decision center too. Very, very simple decisions are made there, but they're decisions nonetheless. So they're the ones processing information for reflexes, and our brain can do a whole lot more. Intelligence, memory, learning. Uh, just make sure you're still with me. Someone give me a shout out in the chat. How are things going? I feel like Phantom of the Opera. Thanks. All right, all right, I'm gonna keep going. So we've sensed something, we've processed that information, and now we're gonna do something with that information. That's our efferent with an E. <laughs> efferent with an E. Um, efferent division, that's sending output signals. <clears throat> so what are we controlling? We're controlling things like muscles and glands. We can control skeletal muscle, we can control our heart, we can control um, our stomachs and so on. Our effort division is very broad. So we can divide it up to the autonomic nervous system and the somatic motor nervous system. One is automatically controlled, but the autonomic is automatic and one is effluent. But again, what they both have in common is that we're sending signals through an efferent pathway to a target cell or a target organ. We call those effectors. So efferents are leading to effectors. I'm gonna draw this on my
to redraw this here. All right, so we've got a sensory neuron. Okay, what I've drawn here, here's a sensory neuron. And this is an afferent path because it's going towards the central nervous system. Okay, so an afferent pathway is sensory. This neuron sends information to the central nervous system, whether it's the brain or spinal cord. Here, we're getting some kind of integration. We're making some kind of decision in the brain or spinal cord. And then this, neur this neuron will tell this other neuron what to do. So this is our motor neuron, our, our efferent neuron. This is our efferent pathway, we're controlling something. Whether it's muscle or a gland or something else. So this is a very basic reflex pathway. You sense something, we integrate that information, and then we do something else. We can divide up the efferent pathway We can divide up the efferent pathway into different parts. So here are those different parts. This pathway we've actually seen a little bit of already. We've been talking about muscles. The neurons that control muscles, they're called somatic motor neurons. Somatic motor neurons. The word soma, that just means body. So it's not the most descriptive. It's neurons that control muscles of the body, which really it's just skeletal muscle. Somatic motor neurons only control skeletal muscle. So skeletal muscles are the effector. And the response, when you control those muscles, you get contraction. So somatic motor, uh, somatic motor nervous pathways, that's co conscious control, though there is automatic control of breathing and automatic control of reflexes like that patellar uh, like that patellar reflex, that knee-jerk reflex. Compare that with the autonomic nervous system. We're on slide 10 now. Compare that with the autonomic nervous system. That's subconscious control. We're not thinking about controlling our breathing. We're not thinking about controlling our, sorry, not breathing, our, our heart rate, our size of our blood vessels, our digestion. These are just things that we don't have to think about. It just happens automatically. So altogether, it's known as your autonomic nervous system. And we can break that down further. The, autom the autonomic nervous system can be broken down into sympathetic and parasympathetic. The sympathetic nervous system, that is relating to your fight or flight response. Um, the way I remember this is uh, no sympathy. If, you, if you're not giving anyone sympathy, like in a fight, then you're just going crazy. That's your fight or flight response. You need, for this response, you need to get your body ready for a stressful event. So increased heart rate, increased breathing, increased blood flow to your muscles. You're getting ready for a stressful event. That's your sympathetic nervous system. Your parasympathetic nervous system, this is your rest and digest. This is when you're nice and relaxed, you want to do all the things that are normal for your body when you're nice and relaxed, like uh, helping your body recover, decreasing your heart rate, decreasing breathing, increasing digestion. So they are complements of one another. Often they'll both control the same thing, like they can both control your heart. One will cause increased heart rate, the other would cause decreased heart rate. So they act against each other. Remember the term that we used for things that act against each other? We, we, we use that with muscles. 
You can use the same term here. These are antagonist systems. This is antagonist control. One the sympathetic nervous system would cause one thing, increase in the heart rate. This would cause the other thing, decrease in heart rate, or decrease in digestion and increase in digestion. They oppose each other. <clears throat> That's autonomic control. Any questions on these branches? Yes, parasympathetic nervous system is getting back to normal. Or just staying normal. Like right now, hopefully you're all relaxed. Your parasympathetic nervous system is winning out over your sympathetic nervous system. Cool. So those are the basic branches of our nervous system. Now we can talk about individual cells in the nervous system. We've all heard of the term neurons. Neurons are the major, I shouldn't say major, they're the functionally important cell type of the nervous system. They're actually not the most abundant, but they're the most interesting. They're specialized cells that help transmit information and tra help, help send information from one place to another. We're, we're telling our body what to do, sending signals. How does it send signals? It's a mix. Within a given cell, it's an electrical signal. So within a given, like within one of these neurons, you have an electrical signal flowing all the way through it. But once the neuron ends, it typically will then communicate with the next neuron through a chemical means. So we've got a neurotransmitter in vessels, and that gets released into the synapse and then communicates to the next cell. So for most neurons, not all neurons, for most neurons to communicate from one cell to the next, it's chemical. But within a given neuron, it's electrical. Uh, what else is unique about nervous tissue, nervous cells? They have a very long lifespan. Most can't undergo mitosis. So you may have heard that if your brain cells die, you can't replace them. That is mostly true. There is one or two areas in your brain where you do get new cells, but it's not, it's not all over the place. If you damage neurons in your brain, if you damage neurons in your spinal cord, they're, for, the, for, for our current technology, we can't replace them. They're, they're, they're dead. Because they're doing so much work, they have a high metabolic rate. They use a lot of energy. Neurons. At the end, uh, Juan's asking, at the end of neurons, are there dendrites that help with the chemical transfer? Um, dendrites, we'll get to in a second. But dendrites are the one that receive the chemicals. When you have surgery, why can't you feel things? Um, you're blocking, what you're doing is you're blocking that signaling from one neuron to the next. Blocking the signal. Good question, Kelsey. Okay, so let's talk about specific parts of a neuron. Um, every neuron, I, I know when we think of a neuron, this is what we think of, but every neuron is, looks different. They don't always look like this. Some do, but not every neuron does. But they all still have the same basic parts. So these basic parts are true for all neurons. And let me back up. Neurons are cells, right? So they have nuclei. They have mitochondria. They have endoplasmic reticulum. They have all those things that we've discussed before. So you should review that if you're not familiar with cell anatomy. Um, <clears throat> all right, let's go over the basic parts of a neuron. One, you have your cell body. Cell body has all your major, major components like your nucleus and all that other stuff. That's your cell body. The cell body is an area of integration. We'll see how that makes sense in a minute. Usually on the cell body side, I say usually because we'll get into shapes later, but usually on the cell body side, we've got branches 
And these branches are called dendrites. Dendrites. Dendrites are for detecting information. Dendrites detect. By having branches, we're increasing surface area. And on these dendrites, we have receptors of some kind. And these receptors detect information. It could be a chemical detection. It could be a physical detection. It could be an electrical detection. It just depends. So that's how we get our input. We detect something with our dendrites. We pass that information through the cell body. And we come to a decision-making decision point between the cell body and this long extension called an axon. This decision-making point is called an axon hillock, H-I-L-L-O-C-K. Think of this as a, mm, I'll get to the metaphor later, but this is our decision point, the axon hillock. We either don't send a signal and nothing happens here, or we do send a signal, and that signal continues along the axon, along the axon hillock. I mean, from the axon hillock along the axon to the end. So we've gone from dendrites, the cell body, axon hillock of the cell body, it's between the cell body and axon, passing the electrical signal along the axon until we reach the very end. The very end of the axon is the axon terminal. The very end of the axon is the axon terminal. So let me draw that more simply. We've got highly branched dendrites. This is my attempt to draw dendrites. We've got our cell body. This area here that's the axon hillock. And then if there's a signal, it would go from the dendrites through the cell body to the axon hillock. If there is a signal, we keep going down the axon until we reach the end. This is our axon terminal. Let's say we're communicating with another neuron. So there's another neuron here. That means these are the dendrites of the other neuron. Because dendrites detect. Axon terminals communicate with dendrites of other neurons. This whole thing, well not this whole thing, but um, this whole region here, where you have axon terminal a gap and dendrites, that's known as a synapse. Where a neuron communicates with something else, that's called a synapse. So neurotransmitter will be released into this area. So a synapse is composed of an axon terminal. This space is called a synaptic cleft. Cleft means space or gap. And then dendrites are our post synapse. So three things make up a synapse, axon terminal, synaptic cleft, and something to detect. If it's a neuron, it's dendrites. If it's a muscle, there'll be a motor end plate. What determines if we have a signal? That we will get into later on how an action potential gets started. So we'll get back to that later, Corey. We talked about, let me go back real quick, we talked about how the whole Gross anatomy organization, the whole organization of the nervous system is input, integration, output. That's at a whole anatomy level. But even at a cellular level, we still have that pattern. Dendrites are your input. Cell body axon hillock is your integration. Axon, axon terminal is your output. It's just a constant sequence of Detecting something, deciding what to do with it, and then controlling something. Detecting something, deciding what to do with it, and then controlling something. <clears throat> what kind of things can we control? We can control 
other neurons. So we can have synapses with other neurons. We can control muscles, whether it's skeletal, cardiac, or smooth. We've gone over this. That's what a neuromuscular junction is. When you have an axon terminal synapsing with a motor end plate, that's a type of synapse. You can also control glands. That's a neuroglandular junction. Whatever it is, it still follows that same basic pattern of axon terminal, synaptic cleft, and then whatever it is you're controlling. <clears throat> All right. So neurons are the major, neurons are the fun, important cell type of the nervous system, but there is another really important cell type that doesn't get much press. That's called a glial cell or just glia, neuroglia. The term glia, that, I think that's German or something for glue, but think of glia as your support cells. They're the glue that holds everything together. They keep everything running. They make sure neurons can keep sending their signals, they clean things up, they provide nutrients, among other things which we'll discuss in a second. So here in this illustration, this blue is supposed to represent a neuron, so you can see a neuron cell body, you can see dendrites, here's the axon coming down, but then in yellow you see glia surrounding the axons, you see glia wrapping around this thing, you see glia hovering around and cleaning things up. In this, electron, in this uh, light micrograph, you've got your neuron, very, very large cell body, very branched, but then you've got other cells surrounding it. Those cells are surrounded, or surrounding and supporting neurons. Their cell bodies tend to be much smaller. Neuron cell bodies relatively, oops, relatively tend to be pretty big. <clears throat> So once again, glia, they're not as cool as neurons, but they are the most abundant and they're essential to how they function. So let's go over some glial cells, some of the major glial cells. The glial cells that we find in the peripheral nervous system versus the central nervous system, they differ. So here we're talking about glial cells in the peripheral, in the peripheral nervous system. In the peripheral nervous system, we have two cell types. One are called Schwann cells, and another are called satellite cells. Satellite cells, as the name implies, like a satellite, what a satellite does is that it orbits something. The satellite cells are just surrounding neurons, so here you can see a neuron cell body, and you can see all these cells that are around it, those are satellite cells. They're, they're just there for support. So satellite cells are your are support cells. Schwann cells do a much more specific and interesting function. Schwann cells form some, something called a myelin sheath. What is a myelin sheath? We'll get to the specifics coming up, but a myelin sheath is formed when a Schwann cell, let's say here's a Schwann cell, and here's the axon of a neuron, the Schwann cell would, will extend its membrane and start wrapping around a part of the axon. Rubber covers up wires for electrical wires. You can see this in a cross-section view in this electron micrograph. This is a cross, so like normally when we think of, when I've been drawing axons, it's been a longitudinal view. But if you cut an axon this way, it's just gonna be a dot. Each one of these tiny, tiny little dots, each one of these tiny little dots, those are axons. This white part surrounding it, that's the myelin sheath. Dot is the axon, white part surrounding it, that's the myelin sheath. So myelin sheath, the term sheath means to cover, it's a special covering of axons. We'll get to its function coming up. How are we on peripheral nervous system glial cells, Schwann cells and satellite cells? Okay. In the central nervous system, in the central nervous system, we have four different types. Ependymal cells, 
It's spelled E-P-E-N-D-Y-M-A-L, ependymal. Ependymal cells, these are lining spaces in the brain or spinal cord. These are lining spaces that we have in the brain or spinal cord. Um, spaces like ventricles or the central canal. Let me, the advantage of being in lab is I can pull out lungs. Ouch. Okay, so here's a model. Here's a model of a uh, spinal cord in the middle here. Hopefully this looks familiar to you. This is a vertebra. Here's the body of the vertebra, superior articular facets, bifid spinous process. So which level of the vertebrae would this be from? Transverse foramina. Hopefully you can get that. So here we're looking at our spinal cord. You see that little hole in the middle? That little hole is called the central canal, and it's lined with a specific type of glial cell. That glial cell is called an ependymal cell. And what ependymal cells do, they're really important, not just for lining these compartments, but they're important for, oops, they're important for producing and circulating something called cerebrospinal fluid. We don't have blood directly providing nutrients for our brain and spinal cord. Blood is not directly providing nutrients for our brain and spinal cord. Um, so you can, it's kind of like how synovial fluid works. I, we mentioned how synovial fluid is bathing articular cartilage, but the thing about synovial fluid is that it has very low nutrients, very low oxygen. We need this thing called cerebrospinal fluid because we want to have this, not for lubrication, although it does provide shock absorption. Uh, we need it because we want to make sure that we, we want an additional filtration system. We don't want anything that's in our blood to get to our brain and spinal cord because that's our control center. If that goes and we're dead. So cerebrospinal fluid is, is highly filtered, excuse me, it's highly filtered blood. Think of, think of it that way. It's highly filtered blood. It's technically interstitial. Uh, but we want to have a separate fluid, and that's lined and created by these ependymal cells. So ependymal cells are super important. If you see, it, you see nervous tissue lining a space, it's an ependymal cell. Second cell type, astrocytes. Astrocytes are a bit like those satellite cells that we just saw. Astrocytes are named because they're star-shaped, astro like space, stars. Star-shaped cells. Sorry, these star-shaped cells. Star-shaped cells, astrocytes, they're basic support like satellite cells, but they do one other thing. I said that we don't want direct contact between blood and nervous tissue, um, specifically the brain and spinal cord. Astrocytes form what's called the blood-brain barrier. You're forming a literal barrier between your bloodstream and your brain, spinal cord. So how do you do that? Um, I'm going to go back a second. I'm going back to slide 14. I know this image is a little messy, but taking a look here, we see that, uh, where are we? Right, here's a blood vessel. So we're, we're somewhere in the brain, let's assume. And here's a blood vessel. This blood vessel is being wrapped and covered by all these astrocytes. So here's an astrocyte. Here's an extension of the astrocyte, and it's covering it up. So basically, if anything's going to pass out from the blood, it has to go through the astrocyte first. So the astrocytes are acting as another level of protection. They're preventing anything from passing through by covering it up. Astrocytes provide a blood-brain barrier. Third glial cell type are called microglia. Micro because they're small, but what's their function? They're your immune cell. We've talked about the immune cell of the skin in uh, stratum spinosum. That was the Langerhans cell or dendritic cell. Um, same idea here, but now this one's specific to the nervous system. This one is phagocytic, meaning it eats and engulfs other things and then can take that vesicle in and digest things with their lysosomes. Um, microglia, specialized glial cell, modified immune cell. 
Last type is an oligodendrocyte. Oligodendrocyte, what does that mean? The word oligo, if you know your Greek, oligo means few. Dendro means branches. It's a cell with a few branches. Oligodendrocyte. This does the same exact thing as Schwann cells, but it does it in a different way. Oligodendrocytes, or let me back up, with Schwann cells, I guess I'll just draw it. With Schwann cells, it's one cell, one covering. So if you want to cover the axon, you're going to need multiple cells. Here's one cell, here's another covering, here's another cell, and here's another covering. That would be for Schwann cells. This is one cell, this is another cell, this is another cell. If this were oligodendrocytes, your cell is actually out here, and it sends out a few extensions that then wrap around the axon. So an oligodendrocyte is sending out a few branches. That's why it's called oligodendrocyte. Oligodendrocytes you only find in the central nervous system. Oligodendrocytes you only find in the central nervous system. Schwann cells you only find in the peripheral nervous system. So if the axon, if the axon is within the central nervous system, then, uh, then it's uh, oligodendrocyte. Would they be, they would never be present at the same time. Not, not in the same area, no. If we're, if we're within the brain and spinal cord, if we're within the brain and spinal cord, then you can find oligodendrocytes. If we're outside of the brain and spinal cord, then it's um, Schwann cells. More questions? So once again, the difference between them, how they wrap up. Here's a cross-section of an axon in blue. Here's the nucleus of a Schwann cell, and you can see the Schwann cell, its membrane is wrapping around a ton of times. Like if you want to stay warm, for instance, you want to insulate yourself with lots of blanket. You just want to keep rolling yourself into a burrito. This is wrapping, about, uh, wrapping around a bunch of times. We're not insulating for, e for heat here. The purpose of this insulation the purpose of this wrapping is to prevent electrical loss. Just like electrical wires are wrapped with wire, one, so you don't shock yourself, and two, so the electricity isn't lost. Same idea. We want to prevent loss of electricity as ions flow down the axon. So we wrap myelin around. Um, can someone tell me in the chat, I'm going to wait a second. Can someone tell me what is myelin made of? What type of molecule is it primarily made of? What type of molecule is myelin primarily made of? Anyone, anyone? Protein? No, it's not protein. My hint to you is that it's membrane. It's, rep it's membrane of the glial cell that's wrapping around a ton of times. So there is some protein, but it's not mostly protein. Lipids, yes. Good job, Salvi. Um, because they're membranes, this is literally just plasma membrane wrapping around a bunch of times. So it's mostly made of lipids, specifically phospholipids. Um, yeah, so. What do you know about phospholipids? Does, do phospholipids mix well in water? Phospholipids don't mix well in water. Lipids in general don't mix well in water. Mo most of the cell, most of the inside of the cell, most of the outside of the cell is water, but we're wrapping all this lipid around it. So we're creating this kind of barrier where lipids and water things that mix well in water don't come, don't work well together so basically any water or anything dissolved in the water inside here can't easily escape we're trapping things in that segment that's wrapped 
we're trapping things on the inside. And that's how you insulate an axon. You're preventing loss of electrical charge as it goes down. So we can look at myelination in cross-section, but remember we can also look at things like this in longitudinal section. So here's axons and myelin sheaths in longitudinal section. When we look at Schwann cells, remember it's one, one cell, one wrapping, another cell, another wrapping, another cell, another wrapping. These are three different Schwann cells. Here, with an oligodendrocyte, you've got one cell creating many wrappings. One other thing that you'll notice is that you have these gaps. So you don't completely cover the entire axon. You have these little gaps. Those gaps, they're called nodes of Ranvier. Can you read that? N-O-D-E, node. And the guy's name is Ranvier, R-A-N-V-I-E-R. These are nodes of Ranvier. So there are gaps in the axons. And you think, why would you want that? You don't want things to leak out. But something else important happens here, and we'll get to that later. It's important for sending the signal quickly along the axon. I'll give you all a moment. We still have our practice questions here. Take a moment. Hopefully we're ready to answer. So let's break this down. We've got brain tumors leading to overproduction of cerebrospinal fluid, which leads to increased pressure in things like ventricles and central canal, and that can lead to more damage. So what cell type could this have could the tumor have developed from if we're talking about overproduction of CSF, overproduction of cerebrospinal fluid? That would be D. The answer is D, ependymal cells. Remember, ependymal cells are the ones lining spaces like ventricles and central canal. They're the ones um, helping produce cerebrospinal fluid. Another question? Okay, we have a damaged blood-brain barrier. So which cell is important for forming the blood-brain barrier? That would be astrocytes, A. Schwann cells are for forming myelin, satellite, or just general providing nutrients, getting rid of waste type thing, general support. And demal cells, we just talked about, line spaces create CSF. Okay, so a lot of you have been wanting to get to this. How do neurons work? What's happening? How do they send their signal? This is a physiology topic. I'm going to, just like we went, like when we went over the sliding filament theory uh, with, with muscles, I'm just gonna kind of breeze through this. I just want you to know the basics of how neurons work. So first, how do we activate a neuron? We activate neurons with something called graded potentials. Uh, that term graded, I don't mean like getting an A, B, C, or D, though that is si a similar term. If you have gradations, that means you have levels. So you can have a little bit or a little more or a little more or a little more or a little more, a gradient of something. 
So we have a gradient of electrical potential. Potential is referring to electrical potential. We're getting a graded potential at the dendritic end. Remember dendrites detect? So if this is our neuron, here are the dendrites and cell body. We activate a receptor here at the dendrites and cell body from a stimulus of some kind, and we get an influx of sodium ion. Uh, right here. <clears throat> okay, so we've got uh, axon terminal from one neuron over here, dendrites of another neuron here. Okay, this is my poorly drawn. Neuron. <clears throat> okay, so from this axon terminal of a different neuron, you get neurotransmitter release. And this neurotransmitter this neurotransmitter will bind to a receptor. So we've got some kind of receptor. <laughs> We've got some kind of receptor here on the plasma membrane, the dendrites of this, of this neuron. Re huge apologies for this really poorly drawn neuron. Uh. All right. <laughs> so these are dendrites here. When that receptor gets activated, that can cause a transport protein, a channel, to open up. And what will happen is sodium ion, sodium ion is allowed to rush into the cell. When sodium rushes into the cell, sodium has a positive charge. Sodium has a positive charge. So you've got this charged thing entering the cell at this point. The closer you are to the opening, that means it's going to be very positive right here. In this ring, it's still positive, just less so. Out here, even less. There are grades to it. There's a higher concentration of sodium here, so it's going to be very positive here. There's a lower concentration of sodium out here, so there's less out here. That's what a graded potential means. We've caused a graded potential in the dendrites and cell body of our neurons. A graded potential. A charge distribution has a gradient. How do we activate a neuron? This is just the start. This is just the beginning of trying to activate a neuron. It's a lot like that game, that strong person game. You can play carvels where you take the hammer and then you hit the, hit the target. Anyone can hit the target, but not everyone can make, make this hit the bell at the top. Hitting the target, you can hit it soft, you can hit it hard. That's very similar to a graded potential. You can have a, a little bit of sodium coming in, you can have a lot of sodium coming in. It doesn't matter so much, well, it's not, it's not about if, whether it's a light amount or a really strong amount, it's whether you hit the bell or not. Did you get that threshold of hitting the bell? So our graded potential may or may not hit the bell. And what's the bell? In our situation, it's found at the axon hillock. This is where the axon hillock comes in. Graded potentials lead to action potentials. Here's our axon terminal. Here we get sodium to come in. If we get enough sodium to come in, if we hit the target hard enough, there's enough sodium that has reached the axon hillock that's when we can get an action potential. There's a certain threshold. There's a certain threshold that we need to meet. You, I'm not going to expect you to know the number for this class. You probably will for physiology. But we need a strong enough stimulus that enough sodium gets here 
and reaches the threshold. If we reach the threshold, then we activate what's called the action potential. And the action potential is a very fast electrical signal that passes down the axon. It doesn't matter if you've reached the threshold just barely or if you've overshot it by a lot. Just by reaching the threshold, you've activated the action potential. You may have heard that an action potential is all or none. That's what that means. Like with that strong person game, you hit the, you just tap the bell or you hit the bell really loudly. It doesn't matter. You're going to get the same prize. You've won. Same is true here. If you just slightly get above threshold or get above threshold a lot, it doesn't matter. You've reached threshold. You'll cause the action potential. What's actually going on? What is this threshold? How do we meet this threshold? Um, to meet this threshold, something special needs to happen up the axon hillock. Here, here are dendrites. Here's our axon hillock. What's special about the axon hillock is that you have, um, like with this, at the axon hillock, I, I know what I should do. Let's compare something. Ba backing up, at the dendrites, at the dendrites, we had these receptor channels. In other words, this is a chemically gated channel. In order for this to open up, you had to have a neurotransmitter bind to the receptor. It's chemically gated. It's reliant on a neurotransmitter. Once we get the sodium to rush in, so let's say we get enough positive charge here at the axon hillock. What's different is we don't have any chemically gated channels over here. We only have it in the dendritic cell body side. Over here in the axon hillock, we have a different kind of channel. Over here, we have what's called a voltage gated channel, voltage gated channel. And voltage gated channels open up not because a neurotransmitter binds to them, they open up if you get enough charge. The, the axon hillock is so essential for making decisions and by deci what, what's the decision? The decision is do we let more sodium in or not? This channel only opens up if you have a strong enough charge. So let's say we do have a strong enough charge. Enough sodium has come to this point. If enough sodium has come to this point, channel opens up, we let more sodium in. And guess what? Over here, we've got more voltage-gated channels. Enough, so enough sodium comes here, we let even more sodium in. And then we let even more sodium in. And then we let even more sodium in. It's that all or none response. We get that positive charge, get more sodium in. Positive charge, more sodium in. Positive charge, more sodium in. We're getting a domino effect. This is why the action potential is all or none. If you activate the first domino, if you activate the axon hillock, you will get activation all the way down to the axon terminal. The action, the action potential starts at the axon hillock, it goes all the way down to the axon terminal. That, in a nutshell, is how neurons are activated, how, what it, how an action potential works. There's obviously more nuance to this, but any questions on that? While I take a water break. Any questions? Okay. Once you get that electrical signal to pass down to the end of the axon, to the axon terminal, it's that action potential that tells vesicles full of neurotransmitter to be released by exocytosis. The whole point of this action potential is one, to travel quickly over a long distance. Neurons can extend as long as your arm or leg. They can be really long. Um, 
But the whole point of the action potential is to reach the end quickly and then cause the release of neurotransmitter. Jose, you're not wrong. Is potassium part of the equation? It is. We're going to skim over that, we'll focus on that physiology. We're just going to focus on the sodium coming in to cause activation in the first place. So, in the axon terminal, you've got vessels just waiting to be released by exocytosis. The signal for their release is the actual potential. We're skimming over that idea, too, of like how, how an actual potential leads to vesicle release. We'll be going over that in physiology. So, why do we need the myelin? Um, what you just have to assume is that all membranes are leaky. Every single cell, yes, their membranes are primarily made, membranes are primarily made of phospholipid, and sometimes you can have receptors, and sometimes you can have channels. But you just have to assume that all cells have pores in them, just random pores, like there's a pore here, there's a pore here. And if there are pores here, that means if charge comes in, charge can just as easily leave. Things can leak out. Our cells normally have leaky channels. And so that can be problematic. Let's say you have a wire that's open, then you're losing electricity. If we have an axon that's uncovered, we'll we can lose electricity, we're losing charge. What myelin does, myelin made of um, lipids mostly, lipids cover up axons and wrap around them. Lipids are, they block water, they prevent water from coming out, which means they also block things like ions. So myelin sheaves help insulate, help prevent loss of charge. That's their major function. Myelin sheets prevent loss of charge. By preventing loss of charge, now the charge can more easily pass from one step to the next. We get a quicker signal. There are neurons that don't have myelin, and that just means they function significantly more slowly. Um, but when you do have myelin, these, these signals are sent very, very quickly. Those nodes, those nodes of Ranvier, those gaps between the myelin sheaves, what you find here are a high concentration of voltage-gated channels. Think of these as your recharge stations. Like we started with the axon hillock at one end, but we need another axon hillock and another axon hillock to keep it going, to keep it propagated. So nodes of Ranvier are just like another axon hillock along the way. It's a recharge station. You need to fill up. It's like a Tesla station. More sodium can come in. Sodium rushes to the next part. More sodium can come in. Sodium rushes to the next part. The term for that jumping from node to node to node, thanks to the myelin and thanks to the nodes, the term for that is saltatory conduction. The word saltatory means to skip, to jump. Saltatory. So many of your neurons, not all, many of them, their axons are myelinated to prevent loss of charge, to help cause a faster signal. <clears throat> oh, my metaphor for this is like a, like a relay race, passing from one to the next to the next. So if one person gets tired, the next person's all ready to go. Now there are diseases, there are conditions where you lose myelin where you experience demyelination. Demyelination is very problematic. If you lose myelin, now charge can leak out. If charge, charge leaks out, you're gonna to get to the axon terminal either slowly or not at all. If you get it to it slowly or not at all, that's gonna cause problems in controlling things. Often it's controlling muscles. Your, your somatic motor neurons are, um, are myelinated that can cause some neurological problems. When it gets really severe, um, when it gets really severe, that can lead to like stopping breathing, 
for instance. And obviously that would be really problematic. That can lead to death. Corey, your question about turning in lab check seven. Um, I'm, I'm not going to be strict about turning it in after 11 o'clock. So turn it in after this if, if, if you want to keep paying attention. I, I, I won't be, I won't penalize you for turning in a little later. Does demyelination cause epilepsy? Uh, I don't know. There's a lot of reasons why epilepsy can happen. I'm unsure if that's one of them. That's an interesting question. Epilepsy is a complicated thing that can be caused by, caused by several things. <clears throat> Take a moment. Okay, so we're talking about this condition called transverse myelitis, inflammation to the spinal cord, demyelination. What does this affect? Um, since we're talking about in the spinal cord, we're talking about in the spinal cord, um, myelination within the spinal cord, it would not be Schwann cells. The answer is C, oligodendrocytes. And Mackenzie, yes, the charge would be slow getting to the axon terminal if you had demyelination. Slow or not at all. It might not get there at all. All right, we're taking a look here. Which cell structure of oligodendrocytes and Schwann cells allows for fast electrical conduction? It's that their membranes are wrapping around. The plasma membranes are wrapping around the axon, acting as an insulation, not for heat, for electricity. The answer is B, the phospholipids that are wrapping around. All right, it's 11.11. I don't know if you all have anything else to do. I'm gonna take a quick break. Let's take a five minute break. I will keep recording. If you need to go, if you have other things to do, I understand this is a recording, so you can get back to this later. Uh, but we're gonna continue this in five minutes. It's 11.12 right now, so at 11.17. Keep the questions coming in the chat.
Jose, are you asking about uh, this question? Um, we talk about oligodendrocytes and Schwann cells. Those are glial cells. They're not neurons. So that crosses out dendrites. I know dendro is in the term there, but all dendro means is branch. Um, so it's not, it's not the dendritic branches of neurons, it's, den, it's branches of the oligodendrocyte. Those branches are membrane that are wrapping around something. So yeah, the answer for this would be the plasma membrane. Okay, uh, here's what we're gonna do. We're gonna keep going. And then I'm probably gonna end this stream and start a new one so people can more easily find it that's specific to lab. Um, yeah, okay. All right, like I was saying before, neurons come in all shapes and sizes. When we see a neuron, like a drawing, you usually see this. You can see dendrites, cell body, axon hillock, axon, axon, axon terminals. There can be more than one axon terminal. It can branch and communicate with many cell, one cell many times or many cells many times as well. So this is generally what we think of when we think of axons, or neurons, excuse me. But neurons, again, they come in all shapes and sizes. Like here is a pyramidal cell. You can see the cell body here. These are all dendrites. Uh, this one is a, a Purkinje cell. This has extremely branched dendrites. Um, here's a granule cell. You can see the cell body here and the axons off to the side. Um, yeah, they come in all shapes and sizes. So when you, when we, draw cells, when we draw neurons, and when we show you models of neurons, don't think that they're all the same, they're not. They all have the same basic parts, they all have dendrites, they all have axons. Um, yeah, so uh, I just want you to keep that in mind, because when we look at histology, they're not always gonna look the same. They're gonna look very, very different. So this, these are examples of neurons, but other neurons look different. So like, here's another example, this is a neuron, this is a neuron, and then there's more complex. Very broadly, we can categorize neurons into three types. I mean, there's, again, this is all arbitrary, but we can categorize neurons based on what they do. If they're in the sensory side, they're sensory neurons. Um, if they're in the brain or spinal cord entirely, that's an interneuron. If they're controlling something, we'll call that a motor, motor neuron. When I say motor neuron, I don't necessarily control. I don't necessarily mean um, moving muscles. It could just mean general and efferent neuron, uh, something controlling something. Could be muscles. Could be glands. Sensory neurons have receptors at their dendritic end. So we've already seen this. Oops. We've already seen this here. This would be our sensory neuron. It's sending information to the central nervous system. What I want you to notice is that this sensory neuron, its receptor is either its dendrites or maybe it's got a special receptor cell. Remember Merkel cells? Merkel cells are special cells that then communicate to a neuron. So whether it's whether it's like a Meister's corpuscle where it's the nerve ending itself or it's got a special receptor cell, this neuron gets activated. The dendrites, the cell body, the axon, they're all outside here in the peripheral nervous system. The axon terminal though, the axon terminal is within the central nervous system because it has to communicate information to the central nervous system. So I'll say that again, for a sensory neuron, Dendrites, cell body, axon are all peripheral. But the axon terminal extends into the central nervous system. Our second type of neuron 
Second type of neuron is an interneuron. An interneuron is the one that's integrating. It's also in between. So hopefully that's easy for you to remember. They're the ones taking sensory information and deciding what to do with it, coordinating some kind of motor output. The difference between the, these and the, the other neurons is that the whole neuron, dendrites, axons, cell body, everything, everything is entirely within the central nervous system. So whether this is the brain or the spinal cord, what we have here, this neuron, if this is the border of our central nervous system, dendrites, cell body, axon, axon terminal, it's all within the central nervous system. No part of it is outside of the brain or the spinal cord. That's an interneuron. Our third type, motor neuron, <clears throat> it's gonna receive signals from the central nervous system because the central nervous system is telling it what to do. Um, but then it has to leave the central nervous system to control something else. It has to control effectors. So dendrites and cell body are in the central nervous system. Dendrites and cell body of the neuron are within the central nervous system, but the axon, axon terminal extend out into the peripheral nervous system. So those are some key differences on where different parts of these neurons can be found. And that will be important. So I'm gonna keep stressing that. Once again, for the sensory neurons, dendrites, cell body, and axon are peripheral, but their axon terminals are in the central nervous system. Interneurons, everything is in the central nervous system. Motor neurons, dendrites and cell body are central. Axon, axon terminal are peripheral. So that's one way we can categorize neurons based on their overall function. We can also categorize neurons based on their shape. Does this sound familiar? We did the same thing for bones. We did the same thing for muscles. Okay, there are several neuronal shapes. You might see other places say four or five different shapes. We're just gonna call them, call, divide them into three basic shapes. There's bipolar shaped, there's pseudo-unipolar shaped, that's a fun one, pseudo-unipolar, and multipolar. All right, what does that mean? A bipolar shape is a very, very basic shape. We start with a bipolar shape. You've got, and I want you to pay close attention. Uh, we are trying to finish chapter 14, yes. <laughs> um, I want you to pay close attention to how I'm drawing this neuron. I represent dendrites with a carrot like this. So that means dendrites. Cell body is represented by a circle. And the axon is represented with a line axon terminal with this kind of uh, filled in carrot. I want you to pay attention to this because one of the upcoming activities, I'm gonna be asking you to make these basic kinds of drawings. Dendrites, cell body, axon, axon terminal. That's how I want you to draw a neuron. A bipolar neuron has it in order. Dendrites leading to cell body, cell body leading to axon, axon leading to axon terminal. Pretty basic. This should actually be a lot closer. It's like right up on the cell body. The dendrites are extending right off of the cell body. So bipolar, what well, that means it has two sides. So you've got the dendritic side and you've got the axon terminal side. Where do you find where do you find bipolar neurons? 
typically they're sensory neurons for special senses. When I say special, I mean specifically for smell, vision, taste, hearing, and vestibular sense. This is your sense of balance, vestibular sense. So your special senses only, this is where you find bipolar cells, only the special senses. Um, on our diagram here, that's what's being represented here. Dendrite, cell body, axon, axon terminal, it's all in one line. They're typically very, very short. And because they're short, they're typically not myelinated. And they don't need to be because they're so short. You don't have to worry about sending the signal over a long distance. You need neurons that have really, really long axons, you need myelination because it's gonna take forever for it to travel. Okay, so bipolar, special senses, things like smell and vision and taste. Next shape is called pseudo unipolar. You can't have a cell that's unipolar because you can't have one side. A cell has to have, have a, a neuron has to have two sides. You have a dendritic end, you have an axonal end. Why it's called pseudo unipolar is because of how it looks. Pseudo unipolar has, it has to have dendrites but then it goes straight from dendrites to axon. So we've gone from dendrites straight to axon. Axon terminal. But then where's the cell body? You need a cell body to cell, after all. The cell body is off to the side. For pseudo-unipolar neurons, the cell body is off to the side. The axon takes up most of the length of the cell. Pseudo-unipolar, cell body off to the side. Where do we find pseudo-unipolar neurons? They're also sensory, but specifically for somatosensation. Things like touch, temperature, pain, itch. Pseudo-unipolar. Cell body off to the side, dendrites straight to the axon. Pseudo-unipolar. We're gonna see why it's important that the cell body's off to the side. They're clustered in specific areas outside of the spinal cord. They're called ganglia, we'll get to that later. Um, Jose, bipolar is sensory, specifically special sensory. Pseudounipolar is also sensory, but it's somatosensation. Multipolar are, can either be interneuron or motor neuron. Multipolar, can be inter or motor neurons. It's the most common type that you find in the central nervous system. So what does interneuron mean, or sorry, multipolar mean? Rather than just having like just a few dendrites, you've got a lot of dendrites. You're receiving lots of input. So the way I'm gonna represent that The way I'm gonna represent that, we've got our cell body. The way we did that for bipolar, we just had one set of dendrites because it's not very extensive. I'm gonna draw it as three to show that there's a lot more. One, two, three. So lots of dendrites, cell body, axon, axon terminal. That would be a multipolar how I would draw multipolar neuron. Multipolar, pseudounipolar, bipolar. <clears throat> Why are interneurons and motor neurons multipolar? They're receiving lots of input. Motor neurons need to receive direction, and they don't receive direction just from one neuron. They receive lots of information. It's like if I'm gonna make a decision, I wanna get advice from as many people as I can. So this is a neuron getting advice, getting direction from lots of input sources, and then it decides what to do. 
Same with interneurons. You're, you're taking all this sensory information in and trying to figure out what to do with it. So that's why you have lots of dendrites, lots of, lots of input coming in. Take a moment. All right, so it's neurons in the retina for vision. So these are the, what help with visual processing. You can see dendrites, cell body, axon, axon terminal. It's a bipolar neuron, the answer is A, bipolar. Okay, so the pathway from the spinal cord to the muscle is not damaged. There's from the spinal cord to the muscle, that's the efferent, efferent pathway. This is not damaged. So which pathway is damaged? It has to be the opposite one, the one coming in, the sensory one, that would be afferent. The answer is A. The answer is A. Sympathetic and parasympathetic, those are examples of efferent pathways. So, so that the only sense you want is a pattern. Okay. We know what neuron cell shapes are. We know the basic functions, sensory, interneuron, motor neuron, and bipolar, pseudo-unipolar, multipolar for our shapes. Now, how can we put all that together? Putting it all together, that's what a reflex is. You sense something, you process it, and then you do something. A reflex. Reflexes don't always involve the brain. Excuse my pointer. Reflexes don't always involve the brain. It can just involve the spinal cord. It could be a motor reflex, which controls skeletal muscle. It could be an autonomic reflex, controlling your heart, controlling your lungs, controlling your digestion, controlling your glands. So a reflex pathway or a reflex arc, that's tracing out that whole thing, where you start an activation of a sensory receptor, whether it's an individual receptor cell or, a, or the covering of a dendrite. We send that information along an afferent pathway. You see the pseudo-unipolar neuron here? A neuron off to the side, so this is, has to be somatic sensation. Axon, afferent pathway, leading into the spinal cord. So this is now getting to the central nervous system. Here's our axon terminal. We process the information in the central nervous system. This interneuron is processing information. It's an interneuron because its whole, whole, uh, all of its parts are within, within the brain or spinal cord. Once we process, we send output. Output means we now control the next neuron. Also notice how these interneurons and motor neurons, they have lots of dendrites. So these are, um, these are uh, multipolar. We send our output through the axon. This is an efferent pathway with an E. Axon terminals control something in a synapse, whatever kind of synapse that is. A, the two basic kinds of reflexes, in terms of like how complicated they are. 
versus a polysynaptic reflex. Polysynaptic just means that there are many synapses. I'm gonna draw what we have here. Let's say, uh, let's say we have uh, a sensory neuron here. Let's say it's a, let's say it's a, a Pacinian corpuscle. Remember, a Pacinian corpuscle, all that is, is a nerve ending, dendrites, surrounded by connective tissue. So there's our Pacinian corpuscle. It's a connective tissue surrounding a nerve ending, dendrites. That sensory neuron gets activated. It's a pseudo-unipolar neuron. And it controls something let's say in the spinal cord. So axon terminal of the sensory neuron ends in the spinal cord. Our interneuron it's multipolar, it's here. So here's our interneuron, it's receiving input from the, from the sensory neuron. Um, it integrates that information at this synapse. So this is one synapse. And then we send information to our next cell, the, the motor neuron, which is also multipolar. Dendrite cell body still in the central nervous system and then we send it put out to something else. We, we sense something, we integrate the information and then we control something. Let's say it's control a muscle. I don't know. Whatever it is. Whatever our effector is. Afferent pathway, integration, afferent pathway. Pseudo-unipolar sensory neuron, multipolar interneuron, multipolar motor neuron. One synapse, two synapses. So there's two synapses. There could be a lot more in between if we had added more neurons in between, but if there's at least two synapses, that's what a polysynaptic reflex is. If there's at least two synapses, that's a polysynaptic reflex. An example of a, of a polysynaptic reflex is a withdrawal reflex. If you, if you hurt yourself on a sharp tack or touch something hot and you immediately pull back, you recoil your arm, that's a, that's a polysynaptic reflex. You sense that pain, you integrate that pain, and then you pull your hand away, you control a muscle. Yes, you feel the pain, so that input also goes up to your brain, and we'll talk about this pathway coming up, but this quicker pathway is automatic. You don't even have to think about it. Before you can feel the pain, you've already withdrawn your hand. That's one example of a reflex. This is polysynaptic. There's more than one sentence. You can have a really, really simple reflex, if you just eliminate that middleman, you, there's no interneuron, that's a monosynaptic reflex, mono meaning one. Let's follow this here. When you do the knee jerk reflex, what you're doing is you're tapping that patellar ligament. When you tap, do I have my knee model here? That's somewhere, okay. You tap the patellar ligament, I can't pull my knee up that high. You tap, you tap the patellar ligament that pulls on the quadriceps tendon. When the quadriceps tendon stretches, you're stretching muscle spindles. Remember muscle spindles? Those receptors we talked about? Muscle spindles stretch. They, they feel that stretch. They detect the stretch. Muscle spindles are nerve endings. They're dendrites. Here are muscle spindles, and we send that information along the pseudo-unipolar neuron into the spinal cord. So this is all one neuron. Here's our axon terminal, which directly controls the motor neuron. So there is no interneuron. It's just sensory neuron straight to motor neuron. Motor neuron controls the muscle. Is the effector you taking the hand away? I would say the response is you taking the hand away. The effector is the muscle. The muscle does the action. The, the effector is, what's, is, is the thing that's doing the action. 
So in this case, the effector is the muscle. Effectors are typically muscles or glands. So this is what's happening when you do it, when you have your patellar reflex and you kick your leg out. You feel the stretch, the muscle spindle gets activated, which then activates motor neurons to control your muscles. Okay, I'm actually going to save these next parts for um, for lab because they're more relevant to lab. Uh, so I'll take questions. Corey, are these all involuntary? Um, reflexes like these are involuntary. You can have if it's called, if you use the term reflex, that means it's involuntary, yes. Though what we will be doing later on is we'll be tracing out pathways that can be voluntary. Um, the, the correct word for them wouldn't be a reflex, we would just call them a neuronal pathway. I'm sure there's another name for it, but I can't think of it off the top of my head. But, but if you say, uh, testing, testing, if you say, if you say a reflex, then it's automatic. Any other questions? Okay, it's 11, it's 11.45 right now, 11.46. When people twitch in their sleep, it's because you've got neuronal pathways that are being activated. Yeah, it's weird. At 12 o'clock, I'm gonna start a new live feed. I'll, I'll actually start it now. I'm gonna end this one and start a new one, and I'll, I'll but look out for the link. Um, in your in your uh, announcements, in your messages. And then if you still have questions, please ask me there. See y'all in a minute. Well, for those of you that can, can show up for this Monday, Wednesday lab, show up. Um, if you can't, hopefully you're watching this later.